I was down, you brought me up. And uh, I think most of us can identify that in some time in our life, can't we? Uh, I don't have a bulletin of the announcements, but I think maybe you know most of them. We're going to be here Sunday morning uh, for preaching. And uh, anybody know the other events that are happening? Thank you, Larry. He remembered that part. <laughs> huh? It's canceled. Okay, so we're just having, are we just having Sunday morning service, or are we? It's regular Sunday evening service. Well, I, I don't know about you, Larry. I think they need to reschedule that pretty soon, don't they? Uh, so, but uh, we'll see you Sunday morning. Any, anybody else got something you want to share? We need to get to our prayer requests, and boy, there's so many. Our pastor and Renee. Uh, our daughter Jody is in Concord Hospital. She went a couple of days ago, and uh, let, let me just tell you a story, and, and maybe it'll help you understand what's going on. She uh, had a doctor's appointment. She had a fever, had to up a respiratory, and the doctor wouldn't treat her, and she was in Concord. They said, you need to go to a, a mer uh, one of these quick care places or either to the emergency room. And so she went to the emergency room, and she got there probably about 1.30, and she sat there, and she called me about 4, she called me about 5, she called me about 7. Still hadn't seen a doctor. At 10 o'clock that night, she finally got back, and she said, Dad, there's 45 people sitting in here. They're all sick. Said so the guy sitting beside him, he's been throwing up blood. He sat there six hours, and he finally got up and just went home. Said so there's a little girl. She's got real issues, and after about six hours, the mother just got hysterical, and they finally got her back. And I thought, what a, what a terrible situation. I, I don't know what the answers are. I don't have answers, but I just feel compassion for all those people. And I uh, just hope you'll be in prayer for those and uh, be careful yourself. But uh, that's kind of what's going on. And a lot of sickness besides the COVID that uh, uh, is taking its toll. That, I think that's what our pastor and Renee have. Anybody else you want to share tonight? Joel? We believe God answers prayers. That's why we pray, isn't it? Amen. Anybody else? Good to see Joanne back tonight. And I bet we probably ought to remind there may be a few left out there. I'm not sure, but... Uh, there usually are, and if you don't mind, if you'll stop by maybe tonight and pick those up. Anybody else got something, Joanne? Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody else? Gene, how about praying for us tonight? And remember those requests in prayer. preacher call today I, uh, I said yes and uh, I thought I might have a little time today but it was a really busy day for me and uh, I thought we would probably just open up and sometimes I love to just study at home and uh, I, I want to kind of let you study along with me okay and we'll talk about some things in here and try to look at a couple of things and uh, we're going to I'll, I'll be in the book of John primarily and as you open that book up, we see a little bit about Jesus, and uh, John begins in telling us about the pre-incarnate Christ. And then in 
verse 19 of that first chapter, we have the testimony of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, to help you understand, I, I want to actually read something in Luke, I mean Matthew. Uh, John the Baptist, you know about him. He was a forerunner of Christ. And it'll help us understand what we're going to talk about tonight. In chapter 3 of Matthew, it says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That was John's call, and it was a fulfillment of that prophecy in Isaiah. And the same John had his raiment of camel hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. He was a different preacher, wasn't he? He dressed different. He preached out in the wilderness. He didn't preach in the synagogue. But look at verse 5. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about Jordan and were baptized of him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, let me explain something about baptism. You see, baptism prior to this, we, we do this and we kind of show the picture of Jesus Christ being buried and, and that's us going down in the water and being raised to new life. Well, this is before the crucifixion of Jesus. Did you know the Jews didn't baptize of their own? Now, if a proselyte came into the Jewish faith and they wanted to be a member, they had to do several things. The, the men had to be circumcised to, for that symbol of the covenant that God made with Abraham. But uh, they didn't baptize their, the Jews. They only baptized those that came without. And this tells us a little bit here. He says, and they were baptized of him confessing their sins. So this is, we're beginning to see a change in the Old Testament to the New and look in verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to him, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Pretty plain spoken, wasn't he? He says, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. And here is the problem, and I want you to catch it in this next verse. And think not to say within yourself, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. One of the problems that the Jews had, they were in a covenant relationship with God. You remember that covenant that God made with Abraham? And many of them, they thought that they were okay because of that covenant. Now, in John, when we get over to this testimony of John, they sent out a delegation to John, and they want to know what's going on. Pharisees and the scribes and the Sanhedrin sent this delegation out, and they wanted to know, John, what are you preaching about and what has taken place? And from 19 through about 34, John just tells what happened about preaching in the wilderness, about Jesus coming there and being baptized of him. And uh, he, they take this message back to the Sanhedrin. And then in chapter 2, there's something I want you to see. Jesus has, uh, uh, it, this is early in his ministry. He's, uh, there are three gospels that talk about Jesus cleansing the temple the last week uh, before he died. But John tells us about an exchange that he had with them in the f beginning of his ministry. And he cleanses the temple, and it tells us that it was a feast of, verse 13, and the Jews' feast of the Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple. And I, I won't continue on, but you know what happened. He ran them out of the temple. And uh, when that happened, the crowd kind of got angry at him. And then we get down to verse 23. I want to pick up here and show you something. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name because they saw the miracles which he did. Now that's the reason many of them believed. They saw the miracles and their faith was just that this man is different. But the question comes... Are these people saved? And, and Jesus, look at the next verse. He says, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. We begin to see, and your Bible might have a little caption above it, that, that Jesus knows the heart. And we begin to look at that, and Jesus begins his earthly ministry. 
And I want to look at two people that he encountered. And as he began to preach and teach, and this little background that we had about the Pharisees, and they sent this delegation to find out about John, we get introduced to a man in chapter 3 of Nicodemus. And I tell you that to remind you, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. It tells us it in the first verse. He was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. You see, the Sanhedrin was a court of 71 men, and they, were, they ruled the temple. And it was like a tribunal. You know, in our, our society, we have a separation of state and church. And in our lifetime, most of us, we've seen a, a, a push towards that, that the state don't want the church in their business, and we certainly as a church don't want the state deciding for us. We, we like to make our decisions. And so this was a little bit different. You see, they, they had the power to do many things. They could not put a man to death. But you remember when they brought Jesus in and they tried him, where did they go? He went, they went before the Sanhedrin, 71 men. They made the rules. These were powerful men. This was like the Supreme Court of Israel is who it is. And Nicodemus is one of those. I want you to get a little picture of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was on the who's who's list, okay? He was a man who had risen. He was a man who was respected. He was a man who was a ruler of the Jews. He was in charge of many things. And we know that he has witnessed and encountered. And Jesus had run those people out of the temple. And the question came up. They said, Jesus, how come you have the authority to do that? What gives you the right? And what gives you the authority that you think you can do that? And you remember that little discussion? They said, well, if you destroy this temple, I'll raise it up in three days. And they said, Jesus, it took 46 years to build this temple. He's, they're talking about the temple they were in. And they said, Jesus, you can't rebuild this temple. And you know the story. Jesus was talking about his body. And he was talking about the resurrection. And so we come here, and Nicodemus is an educated person. He's a good man. He is a well-respected man. He seems to have everything, and he is a, a man that Jesus comes to early in his ministry, and he presents to him, in fact, look at this next verse, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher, come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Nicodemus recognized that Jesus, there was something different about him, but he had not come to the place that he knew who Jesus was. He didn't know the requirements. Now, he should have. He should have because he taught the law. He had the Old Testament. He knew that by heart, folks. He, he was a man who was educated in the law of Israel. He helped make the laws of Israel. And so we see that Jesus takes the time. Nicodemus comes to him. Many speculate he came by night because he didn't want other people to know but he had questions for Jesus about who he was and what he did. He acknowledges you've got to be from God because nobody can do those things that we've seen you do, the miracles that you do. And Jesus, in verse 3, just gets cuts to the chase, and he goes straight to the point. He says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I'm sure that Nicodemus is kind of shocked by what Jesus said. You know what Jesus just told him? He's saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're a good man. You have a lot of qualities, and, and you're a ruler. You're a Pharisee. That means that you worship and you pray five times a day and you give and you do all those things. But there's something lacking in your life. And unless you're born again, you'll never see the kingdom of God. Well, Nicodemus didn't know in verse 4. He says, uh, how can a man be born when he's old? He's thinking about the physical birth. Can he enter into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water, that's a physical birth. When they give birth, the water is broken. And of the Spirit, so there's two births, and he, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And he says to him, Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Nicodemus, you ought to know this. You ought to know this. This is something that you've been in church all your life. You've taught, you've done all these, you've got the scriptures. How come you haven't figured this out? The Bible speaks about the Messiah. And in verse 8, he gives a little example there of 
of the evidence of salvation. Can you see the spirit work? He, you, he gives us a, a relationship like the wind. You, you know the wind's blowing because you see the trees, but you can't see the wind, can you? And the spirit, you can't see the spirit, but you can see the results of that. And you can see the results when a person has given their heart and life to Christ. Nicodemus answered and said, how can these things be? And then look at the response. Jesus gets a little harsher with him. He says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master or a teacher of Israel, and knowest not these things? Now, Nicodemus, surely you've been here, you've been in the temple, you've seen what happened. You know what the scripture says about a Messiah that's going to come, and, and you don't understand these things. You know, I'm glad, and as we begin to look at this, we're going to see Sunday I made a statement, and I made it many times. There's nobody so good that they don't need to be saved. And there's nobody so bad that you can't be saved. Isn't that the truth? That is the truth. That's what the Bible teaches us, that no matter where we are, what our status is in life, we all have to have this new birth. How do you get right with God? What's involved in getting right with God? Well, I think there's three things. The first thing, there is conviction that has to come. My father, when he preached, he used to say many times, he said, you can't get a person saved until you get them lost. And I think you know what he meant by that. Unless a person sees a need in their life to be saved, you can never get them to be saved. You see, that's where Nicodemus was. Nicodemus was a good man. He was respected. He was looked at. He was, he was a, an important figure. He never thought about having to be saved or be born again. John's out there in the wilderness, and he's repeat, he's teaching repentance for your sin. You have to do that. Well, the first step in getting right with God is there has to be conviction. And folks, the Bible teaches us that that's not up to us. Who convicts us of our sin? Holy Spirit does, doesn't it? Holy Spirit, that's his job, is to convict us of our sin. The second thing that has to happen, if you're going to get right with God, there has to be confession of sin. The Bible teaches that, doesn't it? Over and over it teaches that. Why is confession important? I used to wonder, why does God want, to tell me, want me to tell him something that he already knows? He already knows all my sin. Well, let me give you an example at, at the car lot. Every once in a while, we have somebody come in, and they bought a car from somebody, and the person, maybe they bought it in the yard or on the side of the road. The person signs their name on the title. They sign their name as a buyer. And they come in, and they've driven that car for a while, and they put a tag on it, and they just drive it, and they never go down to the license bureau. And they come in, and they want to trade that car in. And we take a look at that title, and we say, you can't trade that car. And they say, well, how come I bought and paid for it? Well, this paper says it's not in your name. See this owner on the front? This is the person you bought it from, and they're the owner, and you can't sell it because you don't own it. Not yet. Okay, you paid the money. But in the state of North Carolina, you know what you got to do. You got to go down there and pay them a few fees. And then they issue another title. And that title has your name on the front of it. And then you can do what you want to with the car, right? You see, here's the point you can't get rid of something that you don't own, right? Can't get rid of something you don't own. Confession is owning your sins, folks. It comes to the place where you say, God, I, I'm confessing it's me, it's not my upbringing, it's not my environment, it's not anything else, it's me. And you see, until you own your sin, you can't get rid of it. God's not going to take your sin until you confess your sin. And so we begin to see the second step is confession. And the third step the Bible teaches is repentance. That's what John was preaching, repentance. What was he saying in repentance? Repentance is turning around. It's changing directions. And when a person becomes a Christian, what we do is we confess our sins, we're convicted, we confess them, and we repent, which means we turn in another direction. All of a sudden, who's in charge of our life? We've been in charge of our life up to this point, but I like to tell folks when you get saved, that's the last independent decision you ever make. The rest of them may come under the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? And so that's how we get right with God. By the way, that's the same way we stay right, isn't it? We, we get convicted, we, we confess, we repent, and that's the way we stay right. Well, Nicodemus was having a little trouble with this because it's hard for a man that's not been so bad and everybody looks up to him, it's kind of hard for him to humble himself and see himself as a sinner. 
You see, in, in our relationship with God, there's two important things. First of all, you have to see yourself. And the second thing, you've got to see him. And those two, if, if you're going to find God, you're going to have to do that. And so Nicodemus asked these questions, and in verse 13, look at this. Jesus said unto him, No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now, Nicodemus knew this. Tyre of Babel, they were going to work their way up to God, weren't they? But that didn't work out too good, did it? You see, the Bible, and I, I told him Sunday, it's like Christmas time. Heaven opens up. God lets down a ladder, and here he comes with a little baby. That's how he came to us, isn't it? He came to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. He revealed himself to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this verse reminds us that we don't work up, but God comes down, and even the Son of Man, Nicodemus should have picked up on that. Son of Man was a term that was the Messianic. It was a Messiah term. And he should have understood that uh, that's who Jesus referred to himself. And then he gave him a good example. Look at this one. Numbers chapter 21. If you go back to that place, the Israelites, they were in, uh, they were in trouble. They started complaining and they said to God, God, you brought us out here in the wilderness, and Moses brought us out in the wilderness, and we don't have any bread to eat, and we're going to starve to death, and we don't have any water, and it was so much better in Egypt than it was here, and God, you brought us out here, and they murmured, and they complained, and finally God had all he could take, and he sent a bunch of serpents, and those serpents began to bite those people, and many of them died, the Bible tells us, and Nicodemus is familiar with this story, and Jesus puts it this way. He says in verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth him should not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus begins to give a picture. And, and this is hard sometimes for people to believe. I tell my Sunday school class all the time, you're not, you're not saved by what you do, you're saved by what you believe. And you have to think about that a minute, but that's what the Bible teaches, isn't it? You're saved by what you believe. Thank goodness we're not saved by what we do because the Bible declares to us that none of us, none of us would make it if that were the way. It's by our belief in him. And Jesus says, and, and it's a picture of the crucifixion, he says, one day, soon, I'm going to be raised up. And faith and belief, just like in that serpent, the folks didn't have to do anything. They just had to look and believe in their heart. And the Bible says that those that had been by the snake, they were healed. You see, that's the way it is with our sin, folks. And that's a picture God is trying to show Nicodemus. And then that famous verse we love so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank goodness for that verse. Amen. That verse right there can save the whole world. And, and we just, I, I just love that verse. And then two more, and then we'll continue on. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. The world through him might be saved. That's why it came. Somebody at Christmas time said if it was an economic problem that we have here, God would send a mathematician or an economist to help us. If, he, if it was our education, he would have sent an educator. He sent a savior, didn't he? That's our problem, and that's what this Bible is teaching. And God didn't bring to, come to bring condemnation. Folks, we're already condemned. We don't have to get condemned. We're already condemned. But Christ came to save. Now let's stop and think about what we've seen here so far. Jesus encounters Nicodemus. Really unlikely. Nicodemus comes at night, probably because he don't want anybody to see and the question is, and lots of theologians, did, did Nicodemus get saved? The Bible doesn't tell us here, okay? doesn't tell us. We see this great encounter, and Jesus tells him how you're saved, but we don't know whether he was saved. I, I believe he was because there's two other instances in the New Testament about, uh, about Nicodemus. One of them is in John chapter 7, verse 50. You remember when he went to the Sanhedrin when they were trying Jesus. Nicodemus stood up and said, you know, we ought not to try a man before we hear from him. And that was the first thing. And then in chapter 19, verse 38 and 39, if you're marking it down, you remember after Jesus' crucifixion, you remember him and Joseph of Mathera came and they asked for the body of Jesus. You remember that? 
And they came and they wanted the body. And the Bible tells us that Nicodemus brought mirth and those burial things. And they took him and they buried him, him and Joseph, buried the Lord Jesus Christ. So we kind of deduct, I kind of think that Nicodemus understood. And I think Nicodemus got saved, don't you? That's what I believe. But that's what Jesus told Nicodemus. Here's the who's who. Let me go over to chapter 4 and let me show you something here. My Bible says a Samaritan woman at the well. And here's what it says in verse 4 about Jesus. He must needs go through Samaria. Why in the world would Jesus go through Samaria? It's out of the way. People there aren't real friendly to the Jews. And the reason that they're not was because, you remember the northern and southern kingdom? Southern kingdom was Judah and Jerusalem was the capital. And then the northern kingdom, when it was divided, Samaria was a capital of the northern kingdom. And in that area, there were many that during one of the exiles, the people were taken away, and the ones that stayed intermarried with the Gentiles. And the Jews hated them. I remember seeing on TV one time, 15 years ago, there was a Jewish man, a devout Jew, and his daughter was marrying outside of the Jewish faith. And they were interviewing him. He said, that's not my daughter anymore. I will never speak to her again. She's not welcome in my house. She knows what she's doing, and she is not a part of our family. You see, those people were raised that way. They were taught that way. And this, these people, the Jews looked at the Samaritans with contempt. And there was even a place, a different place of worship. The Jews believed in Jerusalem. That's where you needed to make the sacrifice. They believed you had to make it in Samaria. So we begin to see that this lady has a lot of strikes again to start with. This lady right here is down at the bottom, folks. A lot of people judge her. Let me tell you a few things that Jesus asked her, and let's look at her. He told her, he said, For thou hast five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that thou sayest truly. He asked her to start with, Go tell your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, Well, you've had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. Now, I, I was one to quickly judge that when I've taught in the past and I learned something and I, I think I look at it a little different. Do you know women in that culture could not get a divorce? They had no rights in court, folks. Women, women could file. The man could put the woman away, but the woman couldn't file for divorce. She, it, was, it was all the men. And so as you begin to look at this, she's had, she's had a, a past probably of abuse, probably of lack of worth. And here she is, she's a Samaritan, and she meets Jesus at the well, and Jesus asked her a couple of questions. He asked her about the water. And we look at this, and we begin to put this picture together. You see, Jesus goes to the who's who, and he goes down to the very bottom too, doesn't he? He takes the time. He deliberately went to Samaria. Everybody else uh, had given up on this lady. Nobody else understood why Jesus wanted to take the time to do that. You see, I'm glad that the Bible pictures it that way, aren't you? That it's whosoever. It's anybody. It's everybody. We all have the same need. It doesn't matter where we've been, what we've done, but it's the same. And as we begin to think about this, I, I think one of the things about salvation that people misinterpret sometimes I've been guilty of saying to people you need to make a commitment to God. You see, being saved is not making a commitment to God. And let me explain that, okay? Before you get mad at me. Commitment means I'm going to tell you something I'm going to do for you. Here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to do this. Now, the Bible doesn't really teach that. Let me, let me explain it with uh, the, the Japanese. September the 2nd. 1945, when World War II was coming to an end, the Japanese were surrendering. They issued a couple of paragraphs. They went on the ship, the USS Missouri, and they brought some documents there for the Japanese to sign and the Americans to sign. Here's what that surrender said. Listen to this. We hereby proclaim the unconditional surrender to Allied powers of the Japanese Imperial Headquarters and all Japanese armed forces and all armed forces under Japanese control, wherever situated. Now, folks, that's surrender right there. There's a big difference. The Japanese didn't tell us what they were going to do for us. You know what they did? 
They came and they said, here we are, and we surrender, and we give up all of our rights, and we are going to do what you tell us to do. You see, that's what the Bible teaches, isn't it? It teaches surrender. It, it teaches us that we take our hands off of our life and allow him to do. You know, one of the problems that we have sometimes as Christians is we get in God's way, don't we? He can't do what he wants to do with us because we're in the way all the time. We're trying to do it ourselves. As we look at that and we begin to understand, Jesus is asking them and he's asking us. He's telling Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you got to give your heart and your life. It's a surrender of your will. It's something that you got to want to do. And it's something that you do and you just give it all to me. I want to close with a story I told some time back in our, when we were doing the Sunday school online. And uh, I think it kind of illustrates a little bit of what I'm talking about. It was a peasant couple that lived in Brazil. They had four children. They were very poor. And there were those four kids. The oldest one was a girl named Christina. And Christina just was so excited, young girl full of excitement, full of potential, smart. And for mom, they were such a poor community in the rural part of Brazil. And uh, Christina kept talking about wanting to go to Rio. And her mom said, honey, you don't want to go to Rio. There's nothing but trouble there. You don't want to go there. Over and over, she kept talking about going to Rio. And finally, one morning, Maria, the mother, got up and she walked by the room for the four kids slept on pallets and one of them was empty. And she knew that Christina had left. And Maria took and she had to walk about three miles to the nearest little town. And she went down there and she took all the money that she had. And in one of the drugstores there, they had one of these things. They used to have one here in town. You've probably seen them at the beach. You can make a black and white picture. And she took her picture, Maria the mother took her picture, and she made copies. She made just as many copies as she had money. And she got a bus ticket and she took off for about a three or four hour ride to Rio. And she got there in big city and uh, she began to look for Maria. She began to look for Christina and she couldn't find her. She went to all kinds of places and she didn't know what to do. And so she took her picture and she put it on grocery stores, and she put it on bars. And everywhere she went, she looked, and she would place those pictures of herself. And uh, she finally ran out of time and the other children and money. And after several days, she put out all the pictures, and, and, and she just had to go home. And she got on the bus, and she cried all the way home. And she got home, and months went by. Months went by. Not a word from Christina. Finally, one day, Christina came out of one of those houses of prostitution and she walked down the steps and she got down to the bottom of the steps and she looked over in the window and there was a picture of her mother. And she looked at that picture and she went over and she took that picture and she held it and she looked at it. And she had so many thoughts. She, she many times had wanted to go back home, but she just, just couldn't do it. Just her pride, she just, she just couldn't and where she had been. In her eyes now, they weren't the, she wasn't the beautiful lady that she was. It had taken its toll, no sparkle anymore. And she looked at that picture and she looked at that picture and she finally turned that picture over and on the back of that picture, here's what was written. It said, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've become, come home. Come home. Isn't that what the Lord Jesus Christ says to every one of us? You see, some of us have made a mess out of our lives. Some have done pretty good. But good's not enough, is it, folks? And when we come and we think about what Jesus did, Jesus went to the lowest. He went to the highest. And I thought, what is our response now? What is our response to the gospel? We look at this and we see what it means to be saved. And I think on a Wednesday night, most everybody here has given their heart and life to the Lord Jesus Christ. What, what is our responsibility? We look around. It's a mess out there, isn't it? It's a mess out there.
told somebody not long ago, I said, there's enough, there's a lot of good people, there's a lot of Christian people in America, but we've lost a few things. I tell you what we've lost, we've lost our schools. We've lost our schools. Send a kid to college today, and if you're not careful, you spend $100,000, and they'll come back and they'll renounce their faith. That's what will happen to us. We've lost, just look everywhere where we've, we just, we just don't have enough of a majority anymore. We're losing in the courts. We're losing everywhere, aren't we, folks? And, and you know, some people, problem, a lot of Christians just have gone home and they just give up. And they sit on the bench and they're not in the game anymore. And they just lost the excitement about Christ. I'm going to tell you something. When I hear stories about Christina, and by the way, Christina did come back home. She came back home. When I hear stories right like that, it makes me remember what Christ put us here for. Why are we here as a church, folks? We're here because there's somebody. There's a, you, you may have a hundred people to tell you no. You may have a hundred people to say no to this church. But thank goodness, every once in a while, somebody says yes, don't they? And that's why we're here. I don't know how uh, you feel about the gospel and your relationship with the Lord. I just know this. The church is so important in the world that we live in. God's placed us here. I believe he's placed South Albemarle here for a purpose and for a reason and for a mission. And sometimes we just get our eyes off of it. It's pretty simple, isn't it? It's not hard. We're a, we're a culture of broken people. You look around and that's all you see is brokenness. We need fixing, don't we? We all need fixing. I don't know about you. I fit in that category. And Jesus Christ came, and he's entrusted with us. He said, here's the gospel. You can't change the world, but you can change a heart and a life. And how do you do it? You do it one person at a time. One person at a time. Have you ever thought in our, our culture, we, we're, I don't know what the statistics in America, when we go to vote, it's about 45 to 52, somewhere there. If, if just a few more. It doesn't take everybody, folks, but if we could impact a, a few more people. We could change things. We could change things for the better. And I, I just challenge you tonight to think about that and consider that. And uh, Danny, if you'll come play a verse or two of a song, I'd like to give you a chance to whatever you want to do. Sometimes people want to come and pray. Sometimes people want to speak to the Lord about their life. Sometimes they want to speak to the Lord about uh, what he wants them to do. You know, I think when we think about that surrender, what we're saying is, God, here's my life. I don't know what it is that you want me to do, but I'm going to say yes now. I'm going to just say yes, whatever it is. When the pastor called me today, I knew I was going to say yes. I decided that a long time ago. I, didn't, I wasn't ready tonight. I didn't feel ready. I just didn't. I just didn't. But I, I wanted to say yes because we just make up our mind, don't we? That, Lord, whatever it is, whatever you can find, whatever it is that you need, whatever it is that I have, if you can use it, we want you to use it. Let's stand, Danny, play us first. If you have a need, come down. <laughs>